Hey guys, it's Max. In this video, I'm doing a review on the brand new Samsung NX500 camera. It's a compact camera with interchangeable lenses. It features a 28 megapixel BSI backside illuminated APS-C size sensor, the same one that's in the NX1. So that's their flagship sensor. So it's a really nice sensor and a really small body. Another feature it has is 4K video recording. That's getting a lot of attention uh, because of the, the price point of the camera, the size of the camera, the sensor, and then the 4K recording. So it packs a lot of features in here. Now, before I get into the video, I wanna say a big thank you to B&H for making this video possible. I'll have a link in the description which you guys can click and find out pricing and availability on this camera. And if you guys purchase one through that link that also supports the channel, helps me keep making videos like these. So thank Thank you guys very much uh, for using that link. And one more thing that I'm gonna have is a comparison between the NX500 and this guy. This is the Panasonic LX100. Now this has a smaller sensor. You can't change the lenses on it, but it's about the similar price point and it also does 4K video recording. So these are kind of rivals in that area. So if you guys wanna see a comparison between these two, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you guys don't miss that video. Let's get into it. Before I get into the main review, I want to say that I was really, really excited when this camera was announced. Uh, it had a really low price point compared to the NX1, but the feature seemed very, very close or very similar. Now as time went on, we got to know more about the camera, and it seems like manufacturers typically give out all the, the better sounding things and don't really give you kind of any drawbacks or anything like that. So you can't really expect a camera that's half the, half the size, half the price, to perform the same as their flagship. So a couple things that changed is it has a crop mode when you're shooting 4K video. You don't have a microphone or a headphone jack. You have a 15 minute recording limit in 4K. You don't have the 120 frames per second. You have 60 frames per second in 1080p. Uh, but those are kind of some of the drawbacks there. You also have a little bit of a lower bit rate when you're shooting 4K. But that doesn't mean that's not a great camera. The, for the price point, honestly, before I get into it, I just say I'm really impressed and I've really enjoyed my time with this camera. I also wanna let you guys know that if you're interested in downloading some uh, JPEG and raw photos as well as some video clips to uh, play around with, to edit, um, to, if you wanna play with the H.265 files, there's a link in the description to my website. You guys can go on there and uh, download those. Let's talk about build quality and ergonomics. As soon as I took this camera out of the box, put it in my hand, it felt really nice. Overall, the build quality is really high and I wasn't expecting that from this camera being a lower price point. Uh, being half the price of the NX1 and including a kit lens, I thought they'd use cheaper materials, but they didn't. Uh, you have the aluminum up top, they, they took the shutter button and they angled it slightly right here over the last version of this camera, so it fits better. Uh, you have your aluminum, you have this fake leather texture here, and it doesn't feel like real leather, but it also doesn't feel like plastic. It's really nice and grippy, and it, it just feels nice. And as far as the grip itself, it fits in the hand perfect. I really would not want them to change it in any way. It's not too big, it's not too, too small, and even if you're using the bigger S lenses, you have enough grip um, where it's not going anywhere. I was using the 50 to 150 lens, and I felt fine just holding it like this. It provided enough grip. Uh, so up top, you have uh, your Wi-Fi button, uh, your on-off button, your shutter. Um, you have the big scroll for different modes. You have a scroll wheel up top, and then on the back, you also have a scroll wheel, which they added over the last generation version. You have your standard buttons on the back here. Um, on the left-hand side, you have a USB 2 and a video out, so there is no headphone or microphone inputs. And on the bottom, of course, you have your tripod mount, you have NFC, you have a battery, and you have uh, your SD card in there. Now, this camera does not have a viewfinder, so you probably already guessed that by now, but just in case you didn't, I wanna let you guys know that. A lot of people love using viewfinders, and uh, you know I've used them for a long time shooting, uh, professionally shooting weddings and other photography, but personally, when I'm using small cameras like these, even if they have viewfinders, I don't really use them that often. Mirrorless cameras focus well using the live view. If you came from Canon, uh, Canons didn't. Uh, so, you know, I just, I find it just fine shooting like this, looking at the back of the screen. Now, of course, if you're out in bright sunlight, there is an advantage over that. But what they decided to do is not have a viewfinder, but instead give you a screen that tilts up completely like that. So you are able to take selfies. Um, I don't know if you guys are interested in that, but personally, when I'm out with my wife, 
uh, hanging out, it's great to be able to take a picture together and not have to ask somebody else. Now, another great benefit is having a screen like this is if you're recording a video for YouTube, a vlog, or anything else, you can you know, either hold your hand out like this or put on a tripod, like what I'm recording right now, and now I can completely see what's being recorded, if it's actually recording, if I'm in focus. Uh, you know, it's really great to be able to have something like this. The GH4 has a screen that flips out to the side, so I'm able to do that. Uh, but not every camera has this, so you know, that is a really, really big convenience, and I definitely would take a screen like this that flips up and out over having a viewfinder in a compact body like this. A couple other things to mention is uh, there is no built-in flash. They give you a little external unit. And uh, there is one negative that I found with a camera body so small. Now, if you have a S lens like these two, you see one on the NX1 and one on the 50 to 150, and you're using a tripod plate, a big tripod plate for like a Manfrotto or Benro or other video tripods, it could get in the way. So uh, you actually have to flip that little plate backwards and so the majority hangs behind the body because the lenses are so big and the camera body is so small. Or you can also get an adapter um, to kind of raise the camera up from the plate a little bit. So keep that in mind. The next thing I wanna talk about is the screen and the menu system. Samsung is using the same screen technology that they use in their smartphones. So this is honestly the, you know, the sharpest, highest resolution, nicest screen that I've seen on a camera. It is just very high resolution, the colors are really nice, it's touch screen, and it's just really, really responsive. It looks really good, so I'm very impressed. And this is the same screen as in the NX1. Another thing that I really like is their menu systems. I'm very impressed. Overall, it's, you know, it just works really well. Uh, the camera is just really quick going through all the menus. It doesn't slow down at all. And uh, the menu systems are very easy to learn and very easy to understand. Now, I've been using cameras for a while, and even though I have a lot of experience if you get a Panasonic or a Sony camera just trying to get through all the menus it just they really make it difficult they don't really know how to optimize it Samsung has a kind of dumbed down maybe you could say or they kind of rename some things or put some things together and uh, if you're used to the big crazy menu systems it might take you a little bit of time to figure out what is what but if you're a beginner going getting into this menu system it's just so much easier to use and to find what you want compared to other camera systems. So I'm very impressed. And uh, just using the touch screen, you can um, scroll up or down, go through the settings, touch whatever you want. And it's just, it's very, very pleasing to use. And after using this camera or the NX1 and then picking up something like uh, the LX100, for example, you just wish that other camera manufacturers could make a system that's as you know, easy to use, uh, while still having all the features, you know, you can still access everything you want to access. And also, it's very fast and responsive. So um, I would definitely give them like an A plus for the menu system if you want to grade it that way. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the kit lens. Now this is a 16 to 50 lens. It has optical image stabilization and it's a power zoom lens. Now what a power zoom lens is, instead of having a manual uh, focus ring and a zoom ring, it has just a single ring on here and it's all motorized and it's more electronic. Now uh, there's a couple benefits to that. Uh, one, you have kind of the main benefit is if you have a smaller um, actual lens. So this, this lens for the sensor size is about half the size of a standard lens and when you turn it on, it extends. Now uh, being a power zoom lens, there's actually a couple buttons. So you can actually just press the button on the side and it'll zoom in and out. And then you also have the, a single ring. Now the ring, you can either have it be uh, for zooming, you can have it be for your uh, manual focusing, uh, or if you press the little eye function button on the side of the lens, um, you'll pop up a little menu, and you, then you can use that same ring to uh, change your, um, your shutter speed, your ISO, your white balance, or your exposure compensation. Um, so that just gives you a smaller, more compact lens, and you can do more with that, with that single uh, ring there. And the eye function setting, um, I personally like it. I think it's a great addition if you're somebody that's just getting into it. You can press that, easily access some different functions if you're not used to um, using the camera here, or if you just prefer that, that way instead. Just a great addition that doesn't take anything away. It just adds more functionality. Another great thing is that this lens is a little bit wider than your standard kit lens. 
If you look at a typical Canon camera, they have a 18 to 50 or an 18 to 55, and uh, with that range, it doesn't seem like a big difference, but on the wide end, that two extra millimeters does make quite a bit of a difference. So this lens in full frame equivalent is about 24 millimeters. Now, uh, the sensor is a 1.5 crop. Canon cameras have a 1.6 crop. So when you take an 18 millimeter lens, add the 1.6 crop, now you're looking at about 29. So even then, it might not sound like a big difference, but 24 compared to 29 on the wide end is actually quite a big of a difference. So it's definitely a bonus to have a little bit more um, on the wide end with this lens. I wanted to do a test on this kit lens to see how sharp or detailed it is. Typically with kit lenses, all you do is you take it off the camera, you sell it on Craigslist, you put it on the shelf, you really don't touch it because they're usually pretty terrible. Now, I was actually quite impressed with the performance of this kit lens, and I can honestly say this is the best kit lens that I've ever used uh, with that comes with a camera. Uh, it's a, a lens that you might actually want to use even if you pick up a couple primes um, or something else. You don't just have to put it away and buy something else. Um, I did a test comparing it to the 16 to 50 S lens from Samsung. Now that lens alone right now is selling for $1,300. So it's a good amount more than this whole setup here. And I was really impressed with the results. At 16 millimeters shooting both of these wide open, this was actually slightly sharper, but keep in mind, this is shooting F3.5 and that was at F2. Now, if we put them both at 3.5 setting, that one is a little bit sharper, but not a huge difference, less difference than I would have thought. Uh, shooting them both wide open at 50 millimeters, which is uh, f5.6 on this lens and f2.8 on that lens. That lens was sharper, but not too much. And then if I match them up both 50 millimeters, both f5.6, so wide open here, not wide open there. That was a big improvement over the kit lens. Um, but still keep that in mind, this is a $1,300. It's their premium best quality lens for the zoom range compared to a kit lens that comes with a camera. So overall, I am very impressed. And if you end up picking up a couple primes or something else, you might still keep this on hand and you'll probably still end up using it. So very impressive, Samsung. Let's talk about photography. Now, I didn't do any professional gigs with this camera, video or photo. I just, just shot some family stuff and I could say it's really impressive. Um, the autofocusing is fast. Uh, especially for a mirrorless camera, it does the job I would say. Um, and the image quality is very high because it's using that really nice sensor that it shares with the NX1. So you have really nice dynamic range, the low light performance is good, um, the autofocus speed is pretty good, and just in general the 28 megapixel uh, sensor of this size matched up with a good lens performs really well. This camera shoots nine frames per second in photo mode with full autofocus and it does a pretty good job. That's impressive compared to other cameras, uh, DSLR cameras, which are typically, you know, maybe five, six, something like that. So they did a good job here. They actually did have to change the shutter mechanism from the NX1. The NX1 does 15, but because the camera is so small, they couldn't fit that in here, but nine is still a good performance. Now with that said, don't expect it to take very many shots shooting nine frames per second. If you're shooting JPEG, you're gonna get about 45 to 50 shots, which is not too bad, but if you're a sports shooter, you know, don't rely on this camera, it's not made for that. If you're shooting raw, you're gonna get about three to four Four images. Yes, this does not have a high buffer. If you're a sports shooter, you definitely want to go with something like the NX1 or go with something uh, like the Canon 7D Mark II. But then again, you're probably not looking uh, for a camera like this if you're a sports shooter. Um, if you're shooting uh, burst mode, it'll do up to 30 frames in about a second, and those are 7 megapixel. Uh, so in that case, you might be better off just shooting a 4K video and then pulling uh, still frames from that video. The camera also has a time-lapse function that works really well. It's easy to use. It also has HDR mode and a couple little uh, smart modes where if you're playing baseball, it'll take a picture right when you hit the uh, ball or if you're golfing, stuff like that. So Samsung's adding a couple more consumer um, consumer features there and then the time-lapse function you guys saw a couple time lapses that I did very easy set up and use you don't need a little external remote or anything like that just like with the NX1 this camera does really well in low light for an APS-C size sensor now this camera 
does better than my old full frame cameras. Now I used to use the 5D Mark IIs, which is now, you know, one generation old. Um, you know, they're, they're soon releasing newer cameras, but uh, I shot a lot of weddings with those cameras and with weddings, you really need good low light performance. And it's really impressive now that we have a APS-C size sensor, a smaller sensor with higher resolution that does better. Now with the 5D Mark II, my limit would be 2000 ISO. I wouldn't go higher than that. With this camera here or the NX1, I would easily go up to 3200. That's kind of my limit for as far as keeping the image quality. And uh, just a little bit back on uh, the last generation of Canon's cameras, even like the T5i, um, I would not go above 800. Honestly, um, just the image quality degrades quite a bit when you go above 800. Here, easily 3200 if you're shooting raw. You know, you could do a little bit of noise reduction and the photos look great. So that's really nice, especially, you know, with kit lenses, you don't have as much light as with uh, prime lenses or more expensive lenses. So you could still take indoor photos without extra lighting gear and have them turn out well. So as far as um, the image quality of the photos, uh, they're fantastic. The low light is really well. And you're gonna take some really good um, selfies with this camera if you pick one of these up. But uh, if you guys are interested in seeing some good photos, uh, join the NX1, not the NX1, the NX500 user group. You can join the NX1 user group as well if you're interested in that camera. But there's a lot of guys sharing the different photos they're taking. There's a couple guys that do fantastic photos um, with this camera. So NX500 user group on Facebook, and you guys uh, can ask questions there and uh, see other people's photos. Let's talk about 4K video. Now, this is the reason why I'm actually even interested in this camera. What kind of got me excited in the first place is it's the least expensive camera with interchangeable lenses that shoots 4K. But before I get into the 4K video, the quality and other things about it, I wanna tell you guys about H.265. If you guys don't know what that is, uh, that's the newer updated uh, codec that's all this camera records, the, the actual format of the video files and it's an update of the older version, H.264. Now this H.265, this newer version, it can actually store more color information, it's a lot more advanced and it's more efficient. So uh, you can actually have half the file size um, of your video clips, but it's still gonna retain the same amount of detail and information. So you can save on uh, SD cards, you don't need cards that are as fast, save on storage on your computer. But there's one downfall about it is, uh, the world's kind of not ready for it yet. If you want to edit the files from this camera, you're gonna have to transcode them, which is basically just converting them to another format. Um, it's gonna be a little bit before the different programs catch up and start supporting this camera. Now we really don't know uh, when, none of the big, um, editing program companies have came out or said anything yet. So, I mean, it could be two weeks from now, could be a couple months, could be half a year. So if you're interested in how I transcode the footage from this camera and from my NX1, I have a video right here. You guys can click on that. It's a program called Wondershare. There's a couple other programs, uh, some free ones, some paid ones as well, and I'll put those up right here so you guys can look those up. So that's one big disadvantage about using this camera if you wanna shoot the video. The video quality on the NX500 is fantastic, and that's not really a surprise. Uh, it uses a really nice sensor. It's shooting 4K, which is just so much more detailed compared to 1080p. The autofocusing system is also just fantastic. It's really among the best, or you can even say the best autofocusing system in an interchangeable lens camera that uses a large sensor. Now, uh, both the NX1 and the NX500 use a lot of phase detection and contrast points, so it's just very, very accurate. And a lot of people have said that they're actually better than uh, Canon's system, which has been uh, the best so far. They're uh, dual pixel technology. So I've actually had this in autofocus, full autofocus, for uh, probably 95% of the shooting, unless I just wanted a lockdown shot without it, you know, trying to think about what it needs to focus on. But it works really, really well. Now the NX500 actually uses a less powerful processor than the NX1 does, even though it uses the same sensor. Now this is because of heat. Because this camera is so small and it just takes so much power to be able to process the 4K video, it would just overheat if it had that same sensor. So it just has a slightly toned down version. Now this changes a couple things. 
One, it doesn't use the full sensor when it's shooting 4K like the NX1 does. It actually uses a center crop one to one pixel ratio. So when you go into 4K mode, the video crops in or what you see on the screen crops in a little bit and I'll show you guys that. Um, two, you have a 15 minute recording limit when you're shooting 4K. Now if you're shooting 1080p, you have a 30 minute just like you have a 30 minute on the NX1. The NX1 has a 30 minute with 4K as well. So you have a shorter record time. Basically, they don't want you to record forever and ever and ever and risk having uh, the camera overheat. So that's because that's why you, we have these kind of limitations is because of heat. Now I did record for about two hours straight. As soon as that 15 minutes ended up, I just hit record again. I did not have any overheating, so you're not gonna have any problems, uh, but they just kind of wanna make sure. With that 4K crop mode, there's some disadvantages and believe it or not, there's also some advantages. If you like shooting really wide, ultra wide, that's gonna be a disadvantage for you because it crops in so you lose your wide angle. You're probably gonna to have to go pick up another wide lens or maybe even a fisheye lens and when you, when you go into the 4K mode and it crops in, it's not gonna be a fisheye anymore. Uh, so you'll see on the screen some kind of examples of how much it actually crops in. So uh, on the other hand though, if you like shooting telephoto, if you're a sports or you shoot wildlife, it might be a benefit to you because uh, it's gonna crop in more, so it's gonna give you more reach. So it's kind of a, either it's a curse or a blessing, depending on what you shoot. Now there's a couple other things, a couple other advantages and disadvantages with that 4 k crop. So first is, um, using one-to-one -one pixels so it doesn't have to compress the image, you're not gonna have any aliasing or moire. So those are artifacting that you get when the image has to be compressed down. Um, so that's definitely a bonus. And another really big bonus is rolling shutter. The NX500 is probably the least, has the least rolling shutter that I've ever seen in a, in a camera. Um, it just, it really impressed me. I was at the park with my son and I did a little check and I see the trees aren't bending side to side. Um, you know, usually they'd be bending way over. So it's definitely a big improvement over the NX1 and other cameras. Um, so another disadvantage is because it crops in on the sensor, you're no longer using uh, APS-C size sensor. You're no longer gonna get that shallow depth of field. I mean, you're still gonna get it, but not as much. So if you're somebody that loves that shallow depth of field look, definitely keep that in mind. And if you're somebody that likes more in focus, that's kind of another benefit to you. So it kind of depends on how you, um, how you use the camera, if that's gonna be a benefit or a, a curse. The bigger brother to this camera, the NX1, actually uses the full sensor and it takes 6.5K video and it downscales it. So what that does is that's supposed to give you a better looking image, more detailed, and it's also supposed to hide the noise because it's kind of compressing it down. So you shouldn't see it as much. Now I wanted to test the image quality of the 4K video uh, between the NX500 and the NX1. So I actually used the $1,300 lens, the 16 to 50 S lens, their professional lens, not the kit lens, to get a, you know equal result. And I tested it against the, cam the NX1 camera. Now it was very interesting. Um, if you're just looking at the 4K file, I did not see much of a difference. Honestly, they looked very, very similar. Now, when I did zoom in four times, 200% uh, uh, zoom to like a 1080p file, I did notice that the NX1's file did look a little bit sharper, but it's not a huge difference. So I was expecting a little bit more of a difference. And honestly, if you're up uploading uh, your video to uh, YouTube or anywhere else online, that difference is basically going to be gone. Um, so uh, it's not that big of a difference in image quality, just very, very slight. Uh, so, you know, that was a good surprise. Now, another surprise that I got is uh, with the low light. I did a low light test against um, the NX1 camera and I was kind of expecting the NX1 to beat it because of the, um, you know, the larger video being compressed down. Now at 1600 ISO and below, the NX1 file did look a little bit cleaner, but it wasn't a big difference. At 3200 ISO, they actually looked right about equal. And at 6400, the NX500 actually looked better. Now I want to talk to you guys about the smart functions of this camera. Now Samsung is really pushing all of their cameras and they're calling them smart cameras uh, because they have a lot of functionality uh, that's, you know, I guess smart, like everything's becoming smart nowadays. And uh, I can honestly say using the system here, this is the best smart 
smart system or you know wireless system app connecting system that I've used between um, any other cameras so it just it works really well it's really fluid and uh, it's easy to use after you set it up now you can uh, you know use uh, your phone as a viewfinder so you can actually see what your camera is showing you can change your settings you can actually take pictures take video and you can actually download them to your phone and uh, you can use it as a shutter button there's a lot of features like that now another really interesting feature is is, uh, it has an email feature so even if you don't have a smartphone or you don't have it with you if there's a wireless network you can actually email uh, photos straight from the camera and to you know to somebody's email so that's really nice to have if you're um, like me you know at a, a party or a get together with family family asks you oh can you send me that picture and I always forget and then two months later they're like hey where's my photo so I actually was using it I just click you know put in their email address and it sends it to them so that's really nice to have now I can't really show you guys um, because the Wi-Fi was really acting up when I'm recording this right now at my office but I have used it and it works really well so um, definitely the smart functions do work well it has NFC to be able to connect to your uh, Android phone faster and you know it's definitely another addition that is very convenient and once you're used to having those things it's hard to go without them the only complaint that I have about the smart functions is it was a little bit harder to set up initially um, than I would have liked it to. It took a little bit longer. I had to have uh, click connect a couple different times for it to actually go through and it actually made me download a couple apps to be able to actually you know, connect to the system instead of just having one app. Uh, so that's something you have, you have to kind of get through. Hopefully they'll keep improving that and update the apps. But once it was connected the first time, after it did the initial pairing, it was easy and quick to connect it uh, to my smartphone. In conclusion, I want to say that I'm really impressed with this camera. I honestly like it more than I thought I would. It's very comfortable, it's small, compact, has a really nice, really good performing sensor, has 4K video uh, that has really good autofocus, has a really nice screen uh, that flips out, so that's very convenient. It's, it's a great camera, and for the price, I would really recommend it. If you're looking for a compact camera that's high quality, takes great pictures, takes 4K video, and you don't mind not having a viewfinder, and you don't mind transcoding your video files until software catches up, I would definitely recommend this camera for you. Now, if you're a person that loves a viewfinder, and uh, you know you love one, I would not recommend it. And if you uh, do want to do the transcoding or converting, or if you're really serious about video, uh, and you need a microphone input or a headphone jack, then I would also not recommend it. I would say just, you know, save up a little bit more, step up to the NX1. You're gonna get a lot of the same features uh, plus more there. But uh, in general, I just think this is a fantastic camera for the money. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you found it enjoyable, informative, or helpful in any way, please give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate that. And if you guys have any questions, ask in the comments below. I will do my best to answer you guys. And if you guys wanna join the NX500 Facebook group, you guys could just search that in Facebook or follow the link in the description. There's a lot of members that are really um, knowledgeable with this camera. They already own them. They're sharing their photos, their videos. If you guys have questions, you guys can ask there. Or if you're gonna buy one of these, you guys can uh, share your photos and videos in that group as well. And uh, I wanna say thank you to b &H for making this video possible. The first link in the description is for this camera where you guys can find pricing and availability. And if you guys order through that link, that helps support the channel, helps me to keep making videos like these. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to make these videos. I don't know if it seems like it, but it definitely takes a lot of time and uh, effort and energy as well. Um, so yeah, uh, if you guys want uh, to download some JPEG or RAW files or some video files, if you guys wanna practice, um, you know, editing those or seeing how they transcode on your computer, follow the link to my website in the description and you guys can download some of those files. So thank you guys. Make sure you subscribe if you wanna see uh, more videos about cameras, about uh, different accessories and gear. And if you guys want to see the comparison between these two cameras, uh, my thoughts comparing the Panasonic LX100, similar price range to the Samsung, make sure you subscribe so you guys will not miss that video. So I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.